if I could leave a legacy. By 1967 and 68, the AFL was no longer worried about surviving. Led by a cast of rebels that reflected the changing times, the league was finally ready to challenge the old guard. The rise of the AFL and the colorful characters leading the charge next on Full Color Football. Hi there, football fans. It's National Pro Highlights time again. And look at that snow. Hmm. Join me for a trip around the circuit for all the big National Football League games. On the, the most exciting new development on the American sports scene came to life in 1960 hmm. with the birth of the American Football League. I got news for you. We're going to win the game. I guarantee. This has got to be one of the greatest football games I've ever seen, Paul. Never fun one on them. This is the story of a love affair. The story of the Denver Broncos and their days in the American Football League. You can get it done. You can get it done. What's more, you got to get it done. Super Bowl I, the first ever meeting between the NFL champion and the AFL champion, was a sparsely attended affair. Sir, looks as time throws in the end zone. Great catch by Mac McGee. Off one hand. As expected, the NFL champion, Vince Lombardi's Green Bay Packers, won in a rout. After it was over, the AFL champion, Kansas City Chiefs, tried to put a good face on a lopsided loss. I thought we played well the first half, and I thought we got off to a good start the second half. They have good people. We had good people. We didn't play our finest ball game. They played well. In the Packers' locker room, the spin was slightly different. My most vivid memory was the press conference with Coach Lombardi standing up there, the commissioner giving him the trophy, and then the press immediately jumped him with the obvious question, all right, Coach, tell us the truth. Were the Kansas City Chiefs better than the other NFL teams? I think the Kansas City team is a real top football team. It doesn't compare with the National Football League teams. That's what you want me to say, I said it. <laughs> when Lombardi said that the AFL wasn't in the NFL's class, someone came running back over to Stram and said, Henry, Henry, did you hear what Lombardi just said? Henry, what is your response to that? To which Stram responded, my response is, I'd like to take this bleep bleep program and bleep 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 bleep. The Chiefs didn't have to wait long to vent their frustrations on the older league. In the summer of 1967, AFL and NFL teams would meet for the first time in exhibition games. The Chiefs prepared for a matchup with the storied Chicago Bears. Mr. Rosell, what are your reactions and thoughts on this uh, interleague play between the AFL and NFL? Well, I think it served as a tremendous uh, stimulus to our season. Actually, we have 16 such games, including uh, the one tomorrow night. We had no respect at that particular time. We were the other league, so there was a tremendous amount of pressure on us to do well in that football game. Cut. Further stoking the Chiefs' ire was a piece of NFL propaganda. The Chiefs had seen the NFL film's highlight of Super Bowl I in the days before their preseason game against the Bears. The screenplay for that film, as I understand it, had been written by Tex Maul at Sports Illustrated, who was close friends with Roselle and certainly an NFL loyalist. Dawson learns the hard way what NFL quarterbacks have known for years. Kansas City did have some stars, but Green Bay was a team of stars. As the game wore on, the Kansas City defensive line folded under the steady pounding of the Green Bay blockers. The Chiefs were helpless to stem the Packer onslaught. On another day in another year, it will surely be the turn of the AFL. But this spectacle of a sport belonged to Green Bay. 
the theme of that show was pretty much someday the AFL might come of age, but right now it can't really compete with the more superior National Football League. And the Chiefs players had been hearing about it, and so they came out for that game loaded for bear. I do remember my rookie year. That was the first home game that I played in. I was so amazed that here we were in an exhibition game, and everybody was so emotional. Tom Bettis, I remember, in a, in, a, in a defensive meeting, almost had tears in his eyes. So they were out to prove something, and, and they sure did. Kansas City is playing an NFL team for the first time since their Super Bowl loss to Green Bay. The final score was not to their liking, but not nearly as unpleasant as the comments that followed downgrading AFL football. In the minds of many, the Chiefs are out for revenge, and this is their first real shot. The Bears had heard about Kansas City's play-action passes, but couldn't stop them. Lynn Dawson, with plenty of time, fires to Otis Taylor. They were absolutely dominant. Shut down Gale Sayers. Unleashed everything they could offensively. Reverses. The Chiefs are showing the Bears a type of offense they haven't seen before and hope not to encounter again. Flanker Otis Taylor on a razzle-dazzle run for 32 yards. It was good to see some payback. The Chiefs had the, the pony war paint. Every time they scored a touchdown, the pony would run around the, the track, around the stadium. And uh, at one point, when it was like 58 to 7, Hillis said, you've just about killed that horse. Don't you think you've scored enough? Kansas City defeated Chicago 66 to 24. To this day, it remains the worst defeat a George Hallis coach team ever suffered and the most points the Chiefs ever scored in a single game. Winning the Bear game like we did and as impressively as we did uh, uh, removed some of the scar tissue that, would, that existed from the loss of the, to the Green Bay Packers. The Chiefs were not the only AFL team to beat the NFL that preseason. The Broncos win was significant because the Lions were considered a contender. And Alex Karras was the captain of that team, and he was ranting and raving about he'll never allow an NFL team to beat a National League football team. If the Denver Broncos beat him, he walked back to Detroit. The Broncos were not one of the dominant teams in the AFL. They were more or less hapless. In many ways, the evolution of the Denver Broncos symbolized the American Football League's long struggle for respectability. Their uniform colors were no longer a source of ridicule. Their socks no longer had stripes. But still, they struggled to get their footing. In their first eight years of existence, they finished in last place six times. In 1967, their head coach was one of the AFL's legendary personalities, Lou Saban. There comes a time when you uh, gain the respect of the people you play against, and the people within the league. So just remember one thing, that you are on your way to be a winner. The optimistic view is that of Lou Saban, new head coach of the Denver Broncos. Saban's job is to redeem the Broncos' lowly estate in the American Football League. Saban never did turn the Broncos into a winner, but he did inject life in a franchise thought to be dead. If I had a bad team, I would, and it was a football team, I'd have Lou Saban coach it, start it. If it was a baseball team, I would have had Billy Martin. I think they were kind of the same guy. Martin and Saban had at least one trait in common. Temper. What the hell? Hey! What is hell? It seemed like Lou was always mad. What the hell is the matter with you guys? My daughter could do better! My daughter could! Your chicken! I tell you, it's gonna cost Benicky, and it's gonna cost Benicky, Benicky! They're playing a preseason game. Denver kicks off, and the other team runs a kickoff back for a touchdown. Lou fired the whole kickoff team. All 11 guys, everyone on that, as they came off the field, you fired, you cut, you cut, you cut. They're killing me, why are they killing me? So Lou Saban wanted anybody trying out for the team to join the National Guard. Otherwise, they were going to get cut because he didn't want to put a player on a roster and then lose him uh, to the service. Unfortunately, some of those players that never made the team were in the National Guard. The next summer, they had to come up to serve their duty. Well, I got a 
get the world off of my back Oh, pretty soon I'm gonna crack As hostilities so grew around the country, the, the AFL became back. a place where angry men could always find a home. Prior to Denver, Saban was the first coach of the Patriots. He then became a two-time AFL champion with the Bills. In Buffalo, he coached one of the game's most outspoken players, Cookie Gilchrist. Cookie came to Buffalo after seven years in Canada, where he was a one-man show, starring at running back, linebacker, even kicker. Cookie Gilchrist kicks off short to Keith Beard, who is tackled by Gilchrist and Billy Graham on the Bombers 32-yard line. In his first year in Buffalo, he became the first AFL player to rush for more than a thousand yards. But by the end of his third season, he had worn out his welcome. Saban traded him to Denver for running back Billy Joe. And in true Gilchrist style, he went out to Denver. He said, I'm going to show you how much better I am than Billy Joe. Billy Joe wore number three. Well, I'm going to wear number two and show you that I'm one better. Billy Joe countered that in Buffalo, where uh, Gilchrist wore number 34. Joe took number 33 for his uniform. Probably the thing that fascinated me most about Cookie is that he liked to say that what made him so effective is that he was relaxed before a game. The reason he was relaxed is he insisted on having sex right before a game. One time I asked him, Cookie, is it true that you have sex right before the game? And he said it was, and I said, is anybody else there? The major reason behind Denver's vault into second place in the rushing department was the acquisition of powerful fullback Cookie Gilchrist from the Buffalo Bills. Although the two-time ground-gaining champion got off to a slow start, he barely missed winning another title. He could run the ball. I think he was better than Jimmy Brown, but he never got the credit. Brown had power and finesse and mobility. I don't think Cookie had that finesse as far as making tacklers miss him, but Cookie had more power than Brown. Cookie would, would run right over a tackler. Cookie was a great football player. Uh, a phenom. I had a lot of respect for his ability. Who gets compared to me and all of that, I care less about. You know, I don't compare a rose to a petunia, you know. They both have their own kind of beauty. It all depends on what you prefer. Cookie lasted just one year in Denver. He then played one season in Miami. He then returned to Denver to be coached by the man who traded him out of Buffalo. Of course, bouncing from place to place was nothing new to the AFL. She's a little bit funky. She came running out of the stands and she ran up, and nobody bothered to stop her. And she runs out on the field. Break it down. And she goes over to the officials and she wants the game ball. And she's trying to get the game ball and they're keeping the game ball away from her. But they're not trying to chase her off or holler for anybody else. Then she runs over to Don Floyd of the order, gives him a big hug and a kiss. Man, that girl is bad. Still nothing has happened. And everybody is standing around and staring and the announcers can't believe what's going on. Now she goes back across and goes up into the stands and sits down where she was before. And the game goes out. <laughs> Unbelievable. Baby, don't you know my girl is bad, yeah. hey. AFL players came in all shapes and sizes. Jim Nance, the Boston Patriots 240-pound fullback, was a two-time rushing champion and the 1966 Player of the Year. The league's smallest player was the Chiefs' primary kick returner and reserve flanker, Nolan Supermat Smith. Nolan, you're not a giant among giants out here. How much opportunity did you get to play in, in college as a flanker? Well, none until my senior year. And uh, after a uh, flanker graduated, well, I had to move into flanker, and I was in the team leading the score from this flanker position. Supernat expressed himself a little better in the open field. 
His 106-yard kickoff return against the Broncos still stands as the longest return in Chiefs history. The trouble for Supernat was when he got caught. Defenders enjoyed swatting him down. Fortunately for the Chiefs, they also had the league's biggest player, Ernie Ladd. The big cat was always ready to deliver payback. Ladd displayed remarkable self-restraint when it came to running down the AFL's golden boy with the feeble knees, Joe Namath. Ernie stood about 6'10", 6'9", 300 and change. I'm going back to pass. Ernie came clean. Ernie knocks me down. My helmet's turned around sideways. I'm looking through the side of the hole. Ernie's helping me up now. He says, hey, don't worry, Broadway. I'm not going to hurt you. I'll hit you high. <laughs> I'm seeing gold flashes and everything. Ladd was a defensive giant, but he wished to be king of a different arena. Pro wrestling. Pro wrestling was, you know, that, that was almost a sport back then. They were quite the entertainer. Joining Ladd in the pro wrestling ranks was fellow AFL player, Native American Wahoo McDaniel. Watch him sweat. He's better than the rest. One year at a training camp, I went and wrestled Gene Kaniski for the World Championship five days after we were in camp. And drove back and got up the next morning and ran and scrimmaged another hour. Ernie, of course, towered over everybody in the ring, and Wahoo would go in there and, and get beat up for, you know, seven or eight minutes and then go into his Indian war dance and pin the guy and win. You don't take no mess. It was very entertaining. So those are, you know, two of the AFL players that probably made a bigger name in the ring than they did on the field, although Ladd was a great defensive tackle. Huge man. McDaniel distinguished himself on the field by being the only player to feature his first name on his jersey. When he arrived with the Jets in 64, Wahoo really began making a name for himself. Our opening game at Shea Stadium, our public address announcer came to me at halftime and he said, Wahoo's been making so many tackles. What if I said to the crowd, uh, tackle by guess who? I said, go ahead and try it. The big linebacker became a New York favorite. When the public address announcer asked who made the tackle, the fans answered in chorus, Wahoo, Wahoo, Wahoo. Guess who? Wahoo. And the AFL got a kick out of it. I don't think George Hallis, Lombardi, and Roselle would have allowed that type of uh, gimmick by a PA announcer back in the 60s. The Patriots publicized the arrival of a homegrown star. And we're very pleased to announce today the signing of uh, Big Larry Eisenhower, the Boston College boy. In a league of rebels, Eisenhower fit right in. They would call me the wild man. I really was kind of wild guy. Animal! I got it. It such an intensity. It was maniacal. I tell you, one of the greatest things in those days was taking quarterbacks out of games. And in my career, I knocked about 18 quarterbacks out of games. Hunting for heads was a popular pastime in the AFL. There were times when offensive backs trying to get out of the backfield, they were almost decapitated. You know, guys would stick their elbows out and, and hit them around the head. Few players knocked more noggins than Raiders defensive end Ben Davidson. In my defense, uh, that was legal, and if you hit a quarterback in the face, there was no penalty for that. Knocked him down, that was a tackle, so uh, life was simpler in the old days. During his playing days, Davidson's motorcycle was his means of escape. I saw the film Easy Rider, and to me, the, the trip on a motorcycle was the thing, not the trip on anything else. It's so nice to get away and go somewhere strange. Pack your bags and get the ticket just for a change. He was 6'7". He was a giant of a guy. He looked ferocious. 
He looked like a Russian czar or something with that handlebar mustache. I just uh, grew that, and it was no attempt to look menacing. I uh, hope my play was menacing enough. In a sport of heroes, Ben Davidson has made his mark as a villain, parlaying a red mustache on top of a six foot eight inch frame. Davidson has earned the reputation as one of the meanest men in football. If you make a tackle and Ben is not laying next to you, duck. Because here comes Ben. Ben would hit the quarterback while he was getting in the car with his girlfriend after the ball game. That was not a late hit to Ben. And we were penalized a lot. We'd have games where we get 200 yards of penalties, and Ben would have 75 or 80 of them. I don't think I'd make it in the NFL today. Fortunately for Davidson, he developed an acting career. A career that began with a fully clothed part in one of the most popular X-rated films of the day. Not great for dialogue, and got a certain amount of notoriety from that. The movie turns out to be, you know, the pornographic hit of the century. So every week for most of the season, an envelope would come. And in this envelope would be these letters written by people. Most of them were misspelling, calling them a pervert, just a degenerate. You are helping send our youth to drugs and hell. <laughs> Davidson's renegade style was a perfect fit on a franchise that had been transformed by another AFL maverick. Since taking over as coach and general manager in 1963, Al Davis began building the Raiders not only a winning pedigree, but a mystique. Which team, by colors alone, is identifiable around the world? Silver and black, tradition, history, nostalgia, commitment to excellence. All those things are the Raiders. We had the opportunity in 1963 to come here and build the finest organization in professional sports. If I could leave a legacy when it's my time to leave, that uh, people all over would remember that patch and say, wow, they, they were good, they were great, and they dominated. In his first season, Davis inherited a 1-13 team and guided them to a 10-4 finish. His efforts rescued a faltering franchise and gave an identity to the city of Oakland. Prestige-wise, Oakland has always been at least one step, more like two or three steps down below San Francisco. San Francisco was the city, and uh, Oakland was the place where there's no there there. This is Oakland throbbing heart of the Metropolitan East Bay, home of the Oakland Raiders of the American Football League, a team which has, under the direction of general manager and head coach Al Davis, enjoyed such a phenomenal growth that it is now being referred to as the coming organization in professional football. I want you to know that this is your team, and I hope you'll grow with us as we grow. He's a very charismatic guy, and if you work for him or you play for him, you, you want to do good for him. Al Davis has the respect of all the players of the 60s. He did a lot for players, he really did, and we really thought the world of him. Davis soon became a key player within the league itself. I think the linchpin was always Lamar Hunt. Without him, none of it happens. His money gave the league the kind of credibility that it needed, but the second most important person in the history of the American Football League was certainly Al Davis for resuscitating the Oakland franchise and keeping a firm tent peg, if you will, driven into the West Coast. But also later when he became the, the AFL's final commissioner, he uh, provided the impetus for the merger of those two leagues. And then he felt he was undercut because Hunt and Tech Schramm from the Cowboys cut a merger deal behind his back. After the merger was announced, Al Davis went back to Oakland almost immediately. I think he felt betrayed. I don't know if that's the word he would use, but a lot of bitterness, a lot of bitterness. At the time, the owners were hoping Al Davis would stay on as assistant commissioner, I believe, to Pete Rozelle. Well, Al Davis is not going to be assistant to anyone.
Across the bay in San Francisco, the summer of 67 came to be known as the summer of love. Nobody wants to get hurt. Nobody wants to hurt anybody. We would all like to be able to live a simple life, a good life, you know, and like think about moving the whole human race ahead a step or a few steps. <clears throat> and, or half uh, a step. Yeah, or a half a step. In Oakland, the human race took a back seat to Davis's obsession with winning. He had assembled a talented team for his head coach, John Rausch, to a roster that already featured future Hall of Famers Jim Otto and Fred Bolitnikoff, Davis added several new faces who would also find their way to Canton. Linebacker coach John Madden, an all-conference tackle at Cal Poly. 1967 was my first year. That was George Bland's first year. Uh, you know, Willie Brown, it was his first year. Gene Upshaw that year was our number one draft choice. If someone wants an opportunity and wants a chance, Al Davis is the greatest at giving him a chance. I mean, you can talk about the people that he's given an opportunity. Right here sits one of the biggest people that he ever gave an opportunity to. Another was quarterback Darrell LaMonica, who Davis traded for that offseason. Four years, a backup quarterback at Buffalo, Darrell LaMonica finally won a regular job at Oakland. The result, an AFL title and Player of the Year honors. LaMonica, the league's top quarterback, threw 30 touchdown passes, leading the Raiders to a 13-1 record, the best ever in the American Football League. But the player nicknamed the Mad Bomber was only part of the 67 Raiders' success. In the AFL, the stories were always the offenses and the offensive players. The defenses didn't get a lot of respect. Our defense started playing well. It got to be, well, what to give them a name. A defensive unit known as the 11 Angry Men. And someone came up and started calling the 11 Angry Men. In the AFL championship, the 11 Angry Men held the Houston offense to just seven points as the Raiders defeated the Oilers to claim their first and only AFL title. The afternoon belonged to the Raiders and their fans. The final was 40 to 7. Losers of 19 straight games in 1961 and 62, the once pitiful Raiders had become the unquestioned champions of the American Football League. Up next was a trip to the Super Bowl. The setting was the Orange Bowl in Miami for the second annual AFL-NFL Championship, which matched the Oakland Raiders with a 13-1 record with the Green Bay Packers. From the game's opening play, the Raiders were out of sorts against the defending Super Bowl champions. An offense that averaged over 33 points per game was held to just 14. You just can't get nothing going. Rolling, you know what I mean? You have her. Right. I right. have her. You have her on a play pass, right? Right. right. On the play pass? Yeah. yeah. LaMonica made one more costly error. Herb Adderley anticipated the play and went for the ball. The Packers turned the game into a rout. You know, I mean, they were a great team. But I, I think we were a lot closer to them than that score. We were so good that year, and I thought there were going to be a lot of Super Bowls. I thought that it, that was the beginning of a real dynasty for us. For the second street year, Coach Vince Lombardi received the championship trophy from Commissioner Pete Rozelle. A wonderful performance by the Flying Football Club. And a great coach. In February of 1968, Vince Lombardi retired as coach of the Packers, but was quickly under consideration for a new position. Richard Nixon was actually interested in Lombardi as a vice presidential possibility in 1968 until one of his assistants said, well, that's great, except he's a Kennedy Democrat. Instead, Nixon settled for Spiro Agnew. Well, Agnew was the uh, governor of Maryland, and Annapolis being the state capital, he was, you know, in Annapolis and played occasionally on the Naval Academy golf course where I caddied during the summer. And he was, you know, notoriously the combination worst golfer, worst tipper uh, combined. So you'd see him coming, you didn't want to be the next caddy in line. You know, you're kind of hoping for somebody else. Throughout the 68 campaign, it wasn't golf, but football that became the preferred Nixon sports photo op. Nixon was a stone-cold fan going back to the 50s. 
Vice President Richard Nixon is the number one fan in the sellout crowd. Vice President Nixon is among the jam-packed crowd with eyes on Johnny Unitas, the great Colt quarterback. He was an NFL guy, certainly not an AFL guy. Bart Starr, not Joe Namath. We're in the midst of another political campaign in this country, but if there is one thing that is non-political, it's being for Bart Starr tonight. Rightly or wrongly, President Nixon was seen as the establishment. He was the old order. The AFL in perception, and I think in reality, was the choice of the young. If you were young, you certainly are not going to identify with the old way. You're not going to identify with the establishment. So if we're going to be interested in football, and a lot of us are, then we're going to at least shade it toward the AFL. Not Bart Starr, Joe Namath. Since his rookie year in 1965, Joe Namath had evolved into a pop cultural phenomenon who reflected the changing times. Namath's white shoes and shaggy hair established him as a trendsetter. So did his prodigious arm. And he, he didn't just luckily get it there. He zipped it there about 30 yards across the field right over the right shoulder. No way the defensive back can get to it. Shut out. I used to challenge him sometimes on a quick route. I'd do a quick out and look back and work out, and I said, Joe, you can't hit me quick enough. And he'd take the ball, pat, turn around, and throw it as hard as he could, and right there it was. I'd catch it as I made my turn, but I learned real quick not to do that without the helmet because he might take your ear off. He just delivered the ball so well. I mean, it, with purpose. I mean, it, it, almost with an anger. Boom, it was out there. I'm going to complete this. The hell with you. And it was like one of these anti-aircraft guns or something, you know, where you aim this way, then this way, then this way, then this way. And he did it. just boom, 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 boom. And it was arrogant and, and tough and, and uh, vicious. You know, he'd jam it in there. And, and if a guy intercepted, he'd curse him on the way out and then jam it in there again. Great way to play quarterback, I think. I remember Namath is just the epitome of in your face. Hey! That willingness to be the upstart and proclaim it. I feel I can throw as well or better than anybody. And uh, I think mentally, throwing the football, uh, well, I feel confident I can play better than anybody that's ever played the position. But for all his success on the field, Namath was just as famous for what he did off it. Namath is a superstar and a super swinger. They tabbed him Broadway Joe for his forays into the neon night world of New York City. The cameras were there to take a picture of Joe with two girls, three girls taking pictures of him going in his apartment, taking pictures of the girls coming out early in the morning. I remember Namath saying in Sports Illustrated, I don't date so much, man, as I just, you know, sort of hang around and see what I run into. You know, it's that kind of attitude that people found so off-putting. I'm sure a lot of people get turned off the way I act sometimes. They talk about drinking and conniving around with ladies and stuff. It seems almost un-American to me for a bachelor not to, you know, go around uh, having a drink with a lady now and then. And why all of a sudden that's become an evil in me, uh, I don't know, but some people don't like it. Well, you can't please any, everybody. Uh, I'm just uh, <laughs> trying to get along, you know, just, <laughs> just trying to get by. Look at that shot. The uh, NFL stood for the old values and Joe Namath was seen almost as the Antichrist with his white shoes and his hair flowing behind his helmet. Quarterbacks were supposed to be the last bastion of everything that was right and proper. You know, they were John Wayne on the football field. People just couldn't see the deeper truth that he had just as commanding presence in the huddle as Unitas had. He just had more facial hair. I grew a Fu Manchu out of respect for Joe Namath, I'll have you know it. And, and that picture was never discovered until Jesse Ventura produced it on Meet the Press. He was campaigning in Minnesota, and a friend of mine from college said, here, next time you're with Russell on Meet the Press, 
pop this picture. And I asked Ventura a very hard question. He said, Tim, I'll answer your question, but explain this. And there I am with a big Fu Manchu, a la Namath. 67, 68, there was a lot of BS going on around with Vietnam, with hair length, with faces, with clothes and all that. To me, people were making a deal out of it. We're wrong. They weren't allowing us to be ourselves, to express ourselves, and still fit in society in a contributing way. At the time, anybody who embodied youth culture was seen as potentially dangerous. The swinging bachelor quarterback in his white shoes, if you came from a certain point of view, that he was trying to bring down the republic. And I'm sure that there were people in the Nixon White House who thought that. Later, during the Watergate hearings, it was revealed that the Nixon White House kept an enemies list. The list kept getting longer and longer. One name, though, that nobody could really quite understand was that of Joe Namath, a good quarterback with bad knees. Nobody knew what his political sins were. Maybe he couldn't go to his right. Joe Namath was the only athlete on Richard Nixon's enemies list. I don't have a clue why Joe Namath was on the enemies list, but I wasn't surprised to see him on the list. Because he was so high profile, Namath came to represent the kind of, and I put this in quotation marks, kind of counterculture that President Nixon and those around him saw as a real and present danger to the country. Joe was a Democrat because he came from a union family, but I don't know of any other reason why Joe would be on the list other than the fact that he was thought of as a rebel. If you look at Nixon's feeling about hippies and long-haired people, Joe was a very visible symbol of that flower power hippie generation. You know, it was nice to see somebody out of the mold, but he wasn't really a countercultural hero, per se. Namath was himself by no means uh, politically radical, let alone even particularly liberal. What Joe Namath represented was a countercultural emphasis on hedonism and individualism. And I think through Namath specifically, people began to associate the AFL, you know, with, with something that was, you know, countercultural and adversarial. The Namath issue is, is a profound one, but he was unique. Back then, how many guys had long hair? Me. You know, Joe Namath did, we knew that. Were all the players, did they have long hair? No. The league was probably portrayed as being anti-establishment, but we as players certainly didn't feel that way. We knew we were the underdogs, but anti-establishment is not a good brush to paint us with, certainly not. At the time, if people were looking to rebel, they had a lot more options than rooting for the AFL. <laughs> Intense fighting both on the ground, inside the buffer zone, and in the air sends Vietnam casualty figures to a new high. What had been what the military calls a low-intensity war expanded tremendously, got deeper, and by certainly 1967, the public opinion was beginning to swing, if not against the war, seriously questioning the war. Young people across the nation were divided on the issue of military service. The playing fields of pro football were no different. By the late 60s, the war was seen by most of us as a wrong-headed thing, and most young men were trying to avoid being sent to Vietnam. You know, I was among them. Uh, let me have your attention. I want you to show by raising your hands whether there's anybody in here that wants this job. I got a job for you. Anybody in here that might want, I'll tell you in a minute, it, uh, it pays about, I'll tell you what it pays about $175 a month. Uh, this, is, this is fighting the war in Vietnam from a helicopter. Anybody here want that job? Raise your hand. There was one man who accepted that job, Bob Kalsu, an offensive lineman who played just one promising season for the Bills in 1968. I'm sure when he took ROTC, he didn't think of Vietnam or anything like that, but he just said, Jan, I'm no different than anyone else. And he said, you know, when they call me up to go, I'm going to go. Kalsu left his pregnant wife and their infant daughter and joined the 101st Airborne Division as a first lieutenant 
atop a hill known as Firebase Ripcord. My last letter that I received from him talks about that the North Vietnamese are all around us and we're in heavy mortar area. On July 21st, 1970, an explosion tore through Firebase Ripcord, killing Lieutenant Kalsu. He is the only player in the history of the AFL to die in the Vietnam War. remains one of the most explosive years in American history. Sock it to me. When Martin Luther King was shot and then uh, Bobby Kennedy after that, the predominant sense as I remember it was, oh boy, we're in the deep shit now. Things are out of control. Suddenly uh, we seem to be in the grips of a kind of madness that uh, there was no way to get out of it, seen. Against this backdrop, of convulsive social change, things are starting to change on the football field as well. In 1968, the Chiefs install Willie Lanier as their starting middle linebacker. And he becomes the first African American to start at that position in the history of pro football. Another barrier being broken down. You get the first first round draft pick of a black quarterback, Eldridge Dickey, by the Raiders that same year. You get Marlon Briscoe as a black starting quarterback in the AFL, significantly the AFL at that time. It was a more egalitarian, more racially mixed, more equal opportunity league, if you will, than the NFL was at that particular time. 1968 also marked a breakthrough for what had been the league's most downtrodden franchise the lowly titans that played before empty stadiums and nearly went bankrupt were now Joe Namath's Jets, the most popular team in the league. I was a huge Jet fan. Uh, you know, my dad's first pro job was with the Jets for eight seasons, and the, the Jets on defense with Jerry Philbin and Paul Rochester, Larry Grantham, Al Atkinson, Berlin Biggs, and John Elliott. I mean, I know all these guys, you know, I mean, that's what's so funny about it. I was like six or seven years old, yet I can always remember them. In 1967, the Jets owned one of the league's best defenses. Joe Namath became the first player to throw for over 4,000 yards, but he also threw 28 interceptions and the team failed to make the playoffs. Joe had to change his ways, and we we're all ready now to bring it to management and, and uh, let them know about it. But the, they knew it. They came to the players and they said, look, you got to get Joe elected captain. You got to give him some responsibility. When he gets this responsibility, he'll show that leadership. As soon as he became captain, we named Johnny Sample co-captain on defense, and the rest is history. In 1968, Namath became less of a showman and more of a complete quarterback. He threw for less yards and less touchdowns, but far fewer interceptions, and the Jets won the AFL's Eastern Division. In November of that season, NBC was on hand for the Jets' highly anticipated meeting with the Raiders. The two best teams in the AFL staged a back-and-forth, high-scoring affair. With 65 seconds left and just before 7 p.m. Eastern Time, Jim Turner kicked a field goal to put the Jets ahead 32 to 29. At 7 p.m., NBC was scheduled to air the children's movie, Heidi. And we came up to that magic hour, and I thought, well, I have not been given any countermanding order, so I've got to do what we agreed to do. I was watching the game. It was cut off for NBC to put on Heidi. I, mean, I really thought that 
they were kidding that they would maybe say it was tidy, but then get the game back on. And of course, they never got the game back on. I mean, it was like totally ridiculous. You know, you're begging to hear what's what happened. And, and you know, I thought that the Jets won that game. They didn't. Monica to Charlie Smith. Smith is hitting and he scores. The Raiders scored two touchdowns in nine seconds and won 43 to 32. And the Oakland Coliseum became an enormous secret love in called the Heidi Ball. There were 10,000 phone calls of complaint to New York NBC alone, so many the telephone switchboards blew out their fuses. NBC apologized for the error, but by then Oakland had scored two touchdowns in the last minute, had beaten New York, the game was over, the fans who missed it could not be consoled. That was the greatest promotion that the AFL ever had was the Heidi game. It was a, a front page story on the New York Times the next day. New York Times doesn't run sports stories front page unless it's a big thing. And there's a lot of stories then written about that the AFL was much more popular than anybody ever thought it was. And it was. The Jets and Raiders then met six weeks later for the AFL championship. This time, not in sunny Oakland, but cold and windy New York. Late in the game, LaMonica and the Raiders trailed by four, but were poised to make another last-minute comeback. But this time, unlike the Heidi Bowl, the Jets' defense and a timely gust of wind stopped the mad bomber in his tracks. LaMonica back to pass, looking, throwing a swing pass behind. He threw the ball behind Charlie Smith. It's covered by the Jets. That was a lateral pass. It was not a forward pass. The Jets were headed for the Super Bowl. The NFL representative in the game would be the Baltimore Colts. Some had called the Colts the greatest team ever assembled. They had outscored their opponents by more than 18 points per game and had won the NFL championship game 34-0. Odds makers had the Jets as anywhere from a 17 to 22 point underdog. Before Super Bowl III at his annual State of the League press conference, Roselle had mentioned that the league was looking at different playoff formats for the Super Bowl because there was a feeling that it was going to be another decade before the AFL caught up with the NFL. These type of things, when people tell you you're, you can't win and the odds uh, were overwhelming and you heard it all week long, we weren't just playing for ourselves. Uh, when you talk to the players, they were doing it for the AFL. I went over to Gold Ocean Mile, the hotel there over on Miami Beach where the Jets were staying. Uh, Joe was down there and he and I used to play golf all the time and he said, come here, I want you to look at this stuff. And so we went up to the room, looked at some film. He said, Marty, we can beat these guys. I said, yeah, you know, I mean, I'm looking at it. I, what the hell, I wasn't looking at it from the perspective of a coach or an analyst. I'm just, you know, I think you probably can, Joe. And he was absolutely convinced that, that they would win the game. I was at the famous Namath press conference when he guaranteed a victory, and the reporters had gathered around with Namath, and they said to him, Joe, do you think, uh, you think the Jets are going to win? I said, yeah. Are you, you really think the Jets, the lowly AFL who've been whipped in two previous Super Bowls, you think you can beat the mighty Colts? He said, well, that's why I play. Why would I play if I thought I wasn't going to win? Uh, are you saying you're going to win? So you guys have been talking for two weeks now. I said, I'm tired of hearing it. I said, I got news for you. We're going to win the game. I guarantee you. It's just out of anger. It was out of frustration. It was my turn to talk, and I was tired of hearing it. That's how the guarantee came out. It was not planned. It wasn't premeditated. It was just anger and frustration. And I really believed we were going to win the game. That story only appeared in the, uh, in the Miami Herald, and... I gave the paper to uh, Weeb. I said, Weeb, before we go down there, you better read this. And he read that. And he said, Dad, gummit, Joe, why'd you have to go and do that? We had them right where we wanted them. You think it upsets them? You think they got the clipping on a bulletin board? Well, I don't think it upsets them. If it does, it's ridiculous. I think they're going to be emotionally ready for this game anyway. And if they have to 
go back and read newspaper clippings to get them up to the game, I think they're in trouble. Well, you've all read and heard all kinds of pregame dope during the week. I think one big sidelight has been Joe Namath. Joe Namath, of course, is the man that the Colts have to stop. But Namath has not been bashful this week. And he has said that the Jets are going to win. He doesn't even predict it. He says, I guarantee a Jet victory. I was 19 years old and living in Buffalo, New York. And for the first time, someone by the name of Namath was guaranteeing the uh, AFL was going to win the Super Bowl. I had a friend named Jerry Lombardo who was entered the Jesuits. He was going to be a Jesuit priest. And he was at a novitiate, which is a seminary for trained to become a priest. And I stopped there to watch the football game. The eyes of a nation were on the Orange Bowl. Could Joe Namath make good on his guarantee and avenge the AFL's lopsided losses in the two previous Super Bowls? I was in, at the game and uh, surrounded by NFL people. And all these people were boasting about the Colts and how they were going to slaughter the Jets. The Jets didn't have a chance. There was no way in the world. You know, that Mickey Mouse League, I was kind of slumped down in my seat because, you know, I didn't want to be noticed too much. But as the game progressed, Joe Namath was able to throw some passes. Matt Snell was able to run. And the defense for the Jets doing a superb job against that cold offense. Now all of a sudden, you know, I'm starting to sit upright in my chair there in my seat at the stadium at the Orange Bowl. Hamas, red hot. Everybody thought he'd get killed in this game. He has killed Baltimore so far. That Snell has been the outstanding runner so far. He's in there. Snell scores. I said, my God, the, the AFC, AFL's going to win. Broadway Joe is going to deliver on his promise. And suddenly um, they turned the TV off, the head pr priest turned the TV off and said, uh, we are now going into the refectory to have our dinner and we eat in silence. And I looked around, I said, Jerry, come here. You're going to be a priest. <laughs> I'm going to watch the Super Bowl. So I'm in there watching the second half all myself. He may be sitting in one of sports' greatest upsets. The Jets, Joe Namath, and the AFL were about to make history. And there was nothing the Colts, Johnny Unitas, or the NFL could do to stop. Intercepted, and he finally downed it at the fourth interception by the Jets of the game. In about the fourth quarter, I'd heard all these derogatory things said about the American Football League that I had to stand up and I said, okay, how does the American Football League look now? Very quiet it became in that section of the Orange Bowl. The game is over. The New York Jets are the world champions. They have upset the Baltimore Colts and beat them handily here today. I walked back into the dining room, and there are all these young men looking at me, and they're trying, and I'm <laughs> and I'm trying to do hand signals, you know, 16 9, you know, Jets, Jets. Finally, he rings the bell and says, Would you please announce the score? I thought I was going to lose a whole generation of Catholic priests who were going to break their vow of silence to find out about Joe Namath. It was a win for the New York Jets and the old New York Titans. It was probably the happiest, most fantastic moment of my life. It was a win for Namath. There was such a feeling of elation, joy, a tickling explosion inside. We did it! We did it! Yes! 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 Oh, it was great. And it was a win for the American Football League. I'd like to think that this will bring all the football closer together because if this does anything, this will solidify the thinking of the public that football is football, the American League, and the NFL can be mentioned in the same breath. After the game was over, many wanted to share in Joe Namath's triumph.
most wanted to shower the conquering heroes with affection. One group just wanted to say thanks. Lenny Dawson, Otis Taylor, uh, Bobby Bell, all those guys were there at the hotel waiting for us when our bus got back. And uh, they had tears in their eyes. And they would say, thank you so very much for winning this game. 11 of us went to the All-Star game. We were playing the West All-Stars, and I was playing against Ron Mix. The first play of the game, when they broke the huddle, he came out and he extended his hand. He says, great job. You made us all happy. The AFL's incredible rise to the top of the pro football world was a difficult one to accept for the National Football League. We were devastated. <laughs> I don't the only person more devastated was Carol Rosenblum. They had a reception at his home, anticipating an automatic win. Behind a rubber plant, all you can see was Carol's hairpiece. He never came out from behind the rubber plant. He was so humiliated. NFL Commissioner Pete Rozelle had explored keeping the American Football League out of the Super Bowl. Now he was the first from the NFL to embrace the opposing league as an equal and to view the historic events of Super Bowl III from its proper perspective. And Rozelle, who was usually a step ahead of most of us, Rozelle said, this is the best thing that could happen to us. Pete proved to be right. Super Bowl III was a victory for the Jets, for Namath, and for the American Football League. But above all else, it was a victory for pro football. The two leagues would soon merge as one to become America's game. And the Super Bowl would grow from its humble beginnings to become the most watched one day sporting event in the nation. But none of this would happen just yet. Next week on Full Color Football. Just keep matriculating the ball down the field, boys. The fourth Super Bowl was nearly as important as the third Super Bowl. <laughs> the Chiefs head down to New Orleans and it's 13 point underdogs. They're doing it again. They're taking the AFL for granted. The 60s will be described as a decade in which football became the number one sport. There'll never be a decade like the 60s. Never. You had the Vietnam War. You had Muhammad Ali, the Civil Rights Movement, Martin Luther King, the Beatles, Elvis, space, all in one decade. And the AFL was there. <laughs>